Welcome to the Future Champions webinar with Matt Mackay in this special session for the Brisbane Raw Football Academy. My name is Stuart Taylor and I'll be your host. Our special guest is Matt Mackay, Brisbane Raw's most capped footballer at 272 games. Matt represented Australia 59 times, participating in the Asian Football Championships and the FIFA World Cup. In 2015, he was voted in the A-League Team of the Decade and is one of only three inductees into the Brisbane Raw Hall of Fame. He is a very proud Queenslander and is truly a legend. Matt, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey with us and the Brisbane Raw Academy. My pleasure. So what are you currently doing with yourself? I'm in lockdown, basically. Um, yeah, I do a bit of coaching. I'm at Brisbane Grammar doing the first 11, organising things there for when they get back. I'm like just spending time with the family and working a bit on my baby playmat business. Matt, I want to take you back to the 13th of March 2011 for the A-League Grand Final where Brisbane Raw took on the Central Coast Mariners. You are the captain for the Raw and it is nil all and you head into extra time. In the 95th minute, the Mariners score. You can see by that video footage that you crumbled to your knees in the goal mouth. How did you feel at that moment? Yeah, disappointed. You know, I probably could have kept my body a bit square. I kind of got a, went to the ball, but more, you know, let down. I think we should have cleared that. It's a crucial, obviously, a crucial part of the game. But yeah, disappointed. But what an incredible achievement to actually make that grand final. Yeah, we had a lot of. It was a great season, honestly. We we uh, I think we lost in round four against Melbourne Victory away, and we from there were under undefeated. So incredible, incredible season. Yeah, I think it was 27 games up to that game. But this was your second year under manager Ange Postacoglu. The year before, the Raw finished second last and recorded their worst performance for a season. What was that first season like for you as a player under Ange? It was horrible, to be honest. You know, it was losing a manager first and foremost. And then there was transition. So Ange came in and, you know, trains were stepped up and he started to... Uh, regenerate the squad. So a lot of my friends were leaving. Uh, a lot of older players were leaving. But, you know, I had a year of my contract, so I, I was going nowhere. And yeah, a lot of home truths were made in that that second part of the season. So what I guess what what changed from Brisbane Raw's philosophy to go from second bottom one year to grand finals the next? To be honest, it was Ange. You know, he he demanded from us. Um, he, he made us know that we've achieved nothing. So. You know, he sat us down in a room and, and told us, you know, me particularly, he said, uh, Matt, what have you won? I said, I've won, I haven't won an A-League title. I haven't won an NSL title. So he said, you know, you, you've achieved nothing. You, you, when you're older, you look back, you don't know how many caps you've had or how many games you play in the A-League. It's how many titles you won. So I said, yep, yeah, I haven't won anything. So it's that drive that he instilled in us. The trainings were meticulous. He had a plan and he made the players buy in. So I want to take you right back to the 25th of May, 1997. Hopefully your memory is good. Uh, you were sitting in Lang Park Stadium, now known as Suncorp Stadium, with 40,000 other fans to watch the Brisbane Strikers take on Sydney United in the National Soccer League Championship final. At the time, you were a football-crazy 14-year-old and Brisbane Strikers season ticket holder and you had the strikers posters on your wall. What were your dreams as a young player watching that game? Yeah, it brings back some great memories. I've watched every single game that season. So uh, even the semi-final, they went away to win it down in Sydney 3-2 to actually qualify, which is a massive game. And these guys were my idols, right? So I've I watched them for years previously. I love the game. You know, that grand final was a, was a huge day. Obviously, Rod Brown and and Frank Freeman scoring the goals. But yeah, I had my seat. I was in the, in the main stand, uh, which is, you know, Suncorp where the change rooms are right on the halfway line. So it was, um, it was a memorable day. And to see the town of Brisbane go football crazy over, over football was pretty good to see as well, wasn't it? The game was huge because we against Sydney United. They had, you know, Kalats and Ante Milicic and Jason Chilina, some guys that ended up playing, you know, big, having big careers in Europe. So, we weren't expected to win and it was, it was just our year and Brisbane went crazy. They had 40,000 at the actual 
and the game is huge for, for football at the old Lang Park. But four years later, you're 18 years old. You've experienced football with the Queensland Academy of Sport, the Australian Institute of Sport, and then went on to play for the Brisbane Strikers, who you idolised. Firstly, how did that feel as a player? But also, how hard was it to transition from, I guess, representative junior football into a national league like the National Soccer League? Yeah, I guess uh, we had pretty good practice. I mean, when you're at school, you know, you're playing for your school team, your club team and representative team. So you had a lot, lot to balance along with your schoolwork. So that transition to from school into AIS was great because, you know, being in Canberra, it was just football. I could concentrate on my game and it really, it made me the player that I am today that year in Canberra. And from there, it was an easier transition to professional football. And, and Brisbane Strikers gave me that opportunity. Delighted, obviously, being a massive fan of the team. So to come back to Brisbane and, and play my first experience of professional football at the age of 18, 19 was, was awesome. But then the National Soccer League, it ended in 2004 and the A-League commenced in 2005. There was quite a large break in between those two. You were recruited to Brisbane Raw by the manager at the time, Miriam Blyberg, and then you played under Frank Farina who, again, if I remind you, you watched play and score in the 1997 NSL Grand Final. What were those initial years like for you and for the club, for the Brisbane Raw, or Queensland Raw, I should say? Yeah, it was, it was exciting because, you know, it's a, it was a whole new entity, a whole new team. It was getting to, you know, we had a good com- camaraderie, but we weren't an excellent team. I think we had, we had fun, but it was, we weren't as serious as, as I felt we should have been or we could have been. But... In saying that, we, we, we had a responsibility for the league and for the game to promote, and we did that really well. So we did a lot of appearances. We're out in the public a lot to grow the game, and that was our responsibility as players, and that's part and parcel of being a footballer. You've got to be able to promote the game as well as play it. So we did that, um, and we did our time um, those first couple of seasons. So let's get back to the grand final. After the Mariners had scored their first goal, it would have been easy for the Raw players to drop their heads. But you seemed to lift your intensity. You had two decent shots. Well, I think they were decent. You had not given up hope and you were leading by example, encouraging your team to reclaim their attacking brand of football, which Ange had built over the season. I'm interested to know what you said to yourself after that attempt on goal, uh, do you remember? I, I hadn't. I had never seen that. I think, but I'm guessing. I'm guessing I shouldn't have shot. I think I was telling myself I'm too far out. I've never scored from there before. Why try now? We're we're more a passing team and create better opportunities. So how hard is it to stay positive when there is that much pressure? You are behind and you're running out of time in extra time. Yeah, we're going to always keep trying. That's what we've um, based our whole season on. It was, like you said, 27 games unbeaten at, at that stage. And we'd been in these situations before that season. You know, we've been behind and it's just about continually doing and playing the way that we had all throughout that time. I think the, the most famous one is our second goal in extra time was Michael Theo had the ball and normally when a keeper and you're behind with four minutes to go or a minute to go, you boot it right as far as you can up the front, but he threw it out and he played out to get that corner. So that shows what Ange had instilled in the players throughout the season. As a captain, did you start to worry at that time that the players were doubting themselves and it might impact the results? Yes, it's only natural. You know, I think a lot of fans thought the same way. Oh no. You know, you start those thoughts, you know, we've gone so far and we're not going to win the ultimate prize. But yeah, like I said, we're, we're always going to keep trying, trying the way that we've played all season. So 2011 was, was a great year for the Raw, but it was also a great year for you, representing Australia in January at the Asian Football Championships. In the quarterfinals against Iraq, with three minutes to go, you cross the most perfect pass to none other than Harry Kill who sinks it in the back of the net, and Australia progressed to the semi-finals. I guess my question to you is, does it get any better than that? Not really. Harry Kuehl's an idol of mine. And just for everyone, I think tonight at 7.30, there's something on him. I think it might be on Fox or it's on YouTube or something. It's well worth getting a hold of and 
and have a look at Harry Kuehl and him talking about his career as well. And if you don't know him, guys, that some of the younger guys, please Google him, have a look because he's he was probably our best, greatest football ever. But yeah, it was a great time for me. Obviously, I'd broken into the national team through Holger Osiek. He's you know had great belief in me, and and coming from the A League was difficult. It wasn't always um, avenues for A League players. So I was confident Brisbane Raw, and that led into that tournament in Qatar, and it was a great month. It really was, and we really should have won the title. You talk about your experience with Australia, and you went from the outskirts of the national side from, I guess, 2006 to 2010, where you played, I guess, four games. And then in 2011, you became a regular feature in the squad. In fact, on the Holgers team, I think there was only two or three games that you missed in the time that he was the manager, and it was either due to injury or suspension, I believe. How important was Holger's affection for the A-League and desire to recruit A-League players to the national side for your development as an Australian representative player? Yeah, it was it was huge. Obviously, they always say, you know, that if you're good enough, you'll end up overseas, but it's, it's not easy to go overseas sometimes. You know, myself, I'm Australian and I'm... I have no passports, right? So I couldn't go directly to the UK or to Europe. I didn't have those European passports that some other people do have. So I had to bide my time. And the only real way I could have gotten overseas was to play for a national team. So Holger, you know, before that, Pim didn't select any A-League players and he made it known that the league wasn't good. And I understand that. It's everyone's opinion. But Holger, you know, backed the individual. And if he thought they were good enough, wherever they played, then he was going to select them. And I'm very grateful for that. Do you think that his philosophy changed even the FFA's decision to, I guess, select a, an Australian manager eventually as well? Because it was something that people didn't think was possible that an Australian manager could get selected as 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 leading that Australian team forward. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's hard to um, determine what they're thinking sometimes at FFA, but obviously Ange had a spectacular record, you know, through the National League and then also with the with his time at Brisbane and then Melbourne Victory. But also he was, you know, did the the youth national team as well. He was an under-20s coach when I was there. Done his time there. He understood players. He knew the players. So I think it was a wise decision and that was justified in how he he's built the national team up to where it is today. So I want to take you back to 2011, the grand final, in the 102nd minute when the unimaginable happens and the Mariners score a second goal and the comeback almost seems impossible. How much did that goal hurt? And did you believe that you could come back at that point? So I know a lot of people who were at the stadium didn't think that or, or, or a number of them left left in the rain because it was now 2-0 behind. So how hard was it? Yeah, it hurt. Yeah, I doubted myself as well. I doubted. I thought, oh, geez, it's, you know, it's not what it's meant to be. All those thoughts go through your head, but we still had you know, 15, 20 minutes left. So, yeah, we're not going to stop, that's for sure. Henrique has talked about this previously, that the halftime message that you gave really inspired him to keep going. He he ends up scoring. What did you actually say in that halftime break? Yeah, I just said, look, guys, we've we've scored two goals in 15 minutes before. You know, why can't we do it now? And I just planted the seed I don't even know if I believe it, to be honest, but just planted the seed for the guys and they didn't stop. You know, we were a very fit side. We'd shown that all season that we'd always come back in games. We did it in the semi final as well. So the seeds were there to, to get the result and to get back in the game. So I wasn't surprised, to be honest. Like the Harry Kuehl assist playing for Australia just m- months earlier, in the 2011 grand final, you lift your head and present a perfectly weighted pass to Solorzano in the 115th minute. He passes it to Broich, who then passes it to Enrique, who scores. What, and, and I, I note that he was actually the one who said that it was your inspirational speech that sort of motivated him. So there's that beautiful goal. It's now 1-2 with three minutes to go. The roar are back in the game. The crowd are back in the game. The never-say-die attitude starts growing in the squad. How do you focus on getting a result in a situation like this where there is so little time? Yeah, we we knew there was little time. It's, it's just instilled in us to go back to the training that we've done all year. So one of the things that a lot of players don't like that 
really worked for us that Ange did was we did patterns all day, every day. So we'd do patterns without, with, with just mannequins up and we'd play through lines, be able to get in the final third, cross and finish. And we would do that emphatically every day. And that's the goal is playing through lines again. So it just becomes instilled to play that way. We don't really change too much. And the guys, it's not robot-like, but it becomes a pattern of play that they understand and it eventually got us the corner that, that got us the goal. And you say that's probably the reason, I guess, the difference between Ange's approach to football that made moments like this count? Yeah, he doesn't panic. He, yeah, he's a manager that, you know, he's a great man manager, but he's also tactically excellent as well. So it's very rare that you get those together. And he was able to put a squad together that was hungry to impress and he made them believe and he had all the right ingredients that, that made our squad that way. So coming to that, those last couple of minutes, he, I'm sure he was proud about how um, we went about our business to get those goals. Now, fast forward to the 18th of June, 2014, Australia are playing the Netherlands at the FIFA World Cup in Brazil. Ange Postacoglu is the manager and you are playing. Tim Cahill receives a weighted cross, scores a breathtaking goal. Considering the circumstances, is that the best goal you have ever seen while playing as a footballer? Yeah, it'd have to be, obviously. He actually scored a bicycle against China in the Asian Cup as well, but the World Cup's bigger than that and I had a perfect angle right behind it. And, yeah, it was a special goal, a special moment in front of a packed crowd in the World Cup. You can't ask more for more than that. And a world-class team you were playing against as well. Yeah, and we really – it was disappointing because, you know, we had we did have the group of death with Chile, Netherlands and Spain and we really should have had a result against the Netherlands. We are leading 2-1 and a couple of sloppy goals midway through that second half that cost us. But we really gave it to them and we scared them and Chile as well. But, you know, some three quality opponents and to play against that calibre of, of players gave a lot of belief to the players that, that ended up going on and, and doing further things for the national team. So what was that experience going to Brazil in 2014 for you? Like what were some of the things that took you by surprise or caught you off guard? A World Cup, it, it's totally different. So so from whatever aspect you're going from, as a player, we literally, we had our own hotel that was guarded. No one else was in there. So we were really, we we're out of the limelight. We didn't really get out of that compound. So we went from there, we'd fly to our game the day before, wherever it was in Brazil, and police escorts everywhere, you know, the hotel before the game, before the Chile game, Chile fans would be outside trying to keep us awake, those kind of stories that happen, you know, that, that people don't really understand, that people try and make you you fail. But the support I know from the Australians at brand new stadiums against the world world class players, you know, the best in the world that on the biggest stage was huge. So to be there for was a dream for me. I was, you know, 31 at the time, you know, coming towards the end. So I'd waited my whole career to, to have that kind of opportunity. And yeah, it was a spectacular time. And what about walking out, singing the national anthem? How was that feeling for that first game for the FIFA World Cup in 2014? Yeah. So I sat on the bench for the Chile game. So it was kind of, it was kind of good to, to just sit back and, and watch it and soak it up and then. You know, the Netherlands, you, you, you sing the national anthem a bit louder when you, you know, and those, that kind of feeling. And, you know, my family was there as well. And so that's what, you know, I wanted everyone to experience it because, it, you know, they'd given a lot to me to, to work my whole career to get there. And I was glad I could give back and, and let them feel that atmosphere as well. Let's go back to the grand final in the 119th minute with one minute to go. The Mariners concede a corner. Broyce takes it, finds Eric Partelou, finds, finds his head, and he finds the back of the net. The greatest moment in A-League history happens before your eyes. Tell me about this moment because I understand it's one of your career highlights. What did it mean for you and what did it mean for Brisbane Raw? Uh, yes, it's just a culmination of a, a season where it was pretty much perfect. You know, that moment, it, you know, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't a, you know, uh, a multiple passes. It was just a, you know, a great corner and a, and a attacking header. So, you know, I didn't even go off with the team 
to celebrate. I was I was chasing the ball just in case it went through and, and missed everyone. And I just kept running that way. So that, for me, I didn't touch the ball, but it was the, it was the greatest moment of my career. It's um, the loudest I've ever, you'll ever hear Suncorp. And it just really, like from there, we knew we were going to win uh, the penalty shootout. And that's the, that's the case though, isn't it? The game's are not over. You still have to win penalties to decide the match. You ended up taking the third penalty, but you actually wanted to take the first. Is that the case and why? Yeah, I would have liked to get out of the way because it's less pressure, I guess, being at the front. You know, I'm not a natural natural penalty taker. I had never taken one before professionally. I stepped up because I was captain and, and you know, felt I should have taken one. So end up being third. I was very fortunate that the person before me, I think it was Danny McBreen, missed. So I, my pressure, it went, it went immediately. So that for me... You know, we'd practice obviously during the week and I just kept my, my side and went for it. For, for Matt Theo to save two goals in a row was outstanding. Yeah, he was a phenomenal keeper. He's, he won five A-League titles. So, you know, you've got to have belief in, in that guy when he's saving penalties. So yeah, two world-class saves. And, you know, that's what we've relied on all season was him to, you know, had been fairly quiet at stages, but when needed, he stood up and he, he definitely did that. So let's have a look at that. It's even in penalties and then Mark Theo saves a cracker. You have the opportunity to put Brisbane in the lead for the first time. You set yourself and score a comfortable goal. Theo saves another goal and then Henrique brings it home and Brisbane win the grand final. What was the difference between the 2011 Brisbane Raw team and all the other teams in the A League, and I think you mentioned this a bit before as well. We had a great belief. It's when people get challenged, how they respond, and we were challenged at the start of the season by Ange and the previous season for the ones that were still there. You've got to have that belief in your game, that confidence, and if a manager instills that, then you've got to produce the goods. You've got to train hard. You've got to work hard. And we did that. People didn't want to lose anymore. They didn't. They wanted to get the best out of their careers and where they were, their standing in the game, because they they know, they know it can end straight away. And people were fighting for their careers. They were, they were working hard, and they had the belief in their game. So that's why it extended to 28 games unbeaten. You mentioned earlier that you had an honest conversation with Ange about what you had achieved, and now you had achieved a Premier's Plate and a Championship. Reflecting on that conversation you had with Ange, what did it mean to you? Yeah, to be honest, the Premier's Plate doesn't mean anything in Australia, so I, I didn't really celebrate when we got that. But, yeah, the A-League title was, it was really cool to be able to get up there with the, with the team and the players. That, you know, you work 12 months, but, you know, some guys have been there, you know, I'd been there for six years, so... You know, some guys like Musselman and the Docker as well that we've been there for that long to really celebrate those achievements is, is big. And that's the thing, you know, guys that have won in the past, wherever they've been, you're going to be able to talk about that in 10, 20 years. And you're not going to talk about, geez, remember that year we came ninth? You can't really celebrate that, right? So we're going to be able to have reunions and, and talk about those good times. And, and I've done, I've done that throughout my career, you know, be able to catch up with players that, the memorable moments are when you won something and done something special. Talking about winning something and doing something special, in 2015, you were part of the first Australian side to win silverware for Australia. Another extra time nail biter. You must really like them now. It was a grand final win against the Korean Republic who equalised in stoppage time. Australia score in extra time to win the championship. What did this tournament and this experience mean to you, particularly towards the end of your career? Yeah, this is my last, you know, big tournament really. And being in Australia was was pretty cool as well. And you know, I wasn't a starting eleven player throughout the tournament. You know, I played it. I started, I think, three games, two two or three games in that tournament. So I had to be ready. You know, I didn't know when I was going to play my part. You know, I managed to score it. In the second game, in our group game against Oman, 
and you know come off the bench in the semi final and then also in the final. So to get silverware, like I said, in the A League was cool, but to win an Asian Cup on home soil in front of eighty thousand people, once again in a team that Ange really inspired to play the right way and with the right desire and and I feel that the right kind of football was something that that made football fans and players strive to, you know, one day pull on that green and gold, which is which is pretty cool as well. So you mentioned that about coming on as a substitute. In in some of the, the games you came on in between anywhere between the say fifty eighth to sixty seventh minute. And how hard is it as a player in in a, such a significant tournament, such a high energy tournament, to actually get on the field and be at the level that you're required to? Yeah, we're very fortunate to to have you know done a lot of work physically to be ready for that. But you know, I'm, I, I was never a bench player. I think uh, for the raw, I, I came off the bench twice in my or once in my whole career. So your job when you come off the bench is not to specifically change the game but it's to increase the tempo of your team for me as a midfielder. So I came on in the semi-final and I was just, I had energy. I brought energy to the midfield. I, I helped the team. I kept possession. I moved the ball well. And, you know, the coaches were delighted with that. That's it. Everyone's got a responsibility wherever you are in the park. And if you can do your job, then as a team, you're going to be a better article. You're going to win titles or you're going to win games. And, whether I played or not, that team, everyone knew their roles and responsibilities and, and they performed them. Reflecting on your journey in the green and gold from 2000, from the 2011 AFC to, say, the 2015 AFC, was it everything that you had hoped it would be? Yes. You know, I played a lot of games and got to travel the world and play against some awesome teams. You know, we beat Germany in Germany which was awesome. You know, went to a World Cup and won the Asian Cup and went to a final of another Asian Cup. So that four years was, yeah, it was a dream come true for me. And, I, you know, I managed to get a move to, you know, one of the biggest teams in Scotland or the biggest team in Scotland uh, at Rangers. And, Are you breaking up? <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, I spent a bit of time in Asia as well. So, that was the reward for me, I guess, of breaking into the national team was, was getting those moves overseas and, and being able to experience different cultures and, and test myself in different leagues. So let's talk about your, your travels to Scotland. You did go to Scotland. You played for probably the second top team in the competition, it being Rangers, and a great opportunity, but I guess at the worst time because that was the year that, Rangers went into administration. So it would have been really hard for you to chase that dream, get that dream, and then I guess have it taken away from you. Yeah. You know, looking back on it, it probably wasn't the best move for me football wise. I knew that going there, but I was always going to go. I was 28. You know, I managed to get a visa through my amount of games I'd played for the national team. So that's how I got into the UK. And yes, I didn't play many games there, but I really enjoyed going to a club of that stature and the facilities that they had and the passion they had for the game. I think that was pretty important. I hated the cold. I still hate the cold. That's why I'm still in Brisbane. But, you know, being there led me on to other moves as well. So I had my time in, in Korea and also in China. You mentioned that you, because there are strange visa requirements through FIFA and junior players can't go and play in Scotland, for example. But you mentioned that you had because of your, your, the number of games you played for the national team, you were able to go over. Can you explain what that process is and what it means? Yeah, so you need a work permit to go into the UK. And at the time, it's, I'm sure it's, it has changed now. It may be even more difficult. But if you had played 75% of internationals for your country in the past two years, then you'd get a work permit to play. And I was very fortunate, Rangers had a big standing and, and they said they wanted me. I hadn't actually played my 75% of games, but they could prove that with the next windows coming up that I would have reached that 75% of games. So my work permit went through and I was granted my contract in, in Scotland. And I note that in one of those international games that dropped you below, you didn't actually play against Scotland. Was that a requirement of your visa? No, it wasn't. I, I was really looking forward to that game, to be honest, because I think that game was played after I'd, I'd left. I'd gone to Korea and I really want to go back to prove a point, but I, will, I was, 
I was injured from my time in Korea, which was brutal, the, the training they do there. I think I got injured for the national team in a game against Japan in Brisbane and was out for a couple of months. So I missed that Scotland friendly. What was it like in Korea and China in particular? Because you weren't in China, you weren't actually in that big city. You were, you were, you were a little bit further out than that, weren't you? Yeah, I was in a horrible town, to be honest, really small up in, or small to, to their standards. There's still 7 million people in this city uh, in Chanchun up in the northeast in between North Korea and Russia. It's a difficult place because it's minus 30 in, in winter. So we spend the majority of pre-season in other parts. So I got married in the end of 2012 after being in Korea for a year. And then from there, I flew back to pre-season in Korea and was sold to my team in China. And in China, like I said, we're away. So I didn't see my wife for three months while I was in, in pre-season camp. And, you know, you spend that time away with guys that don't speak English. It's a, it's a test. So I, I enjoy the football there. It wasn't a short lived stay even the second time. I was, I was very fortunate. I went back to the same club. I was on loan there in 2009 and went back to the same one. So I was very friendly with a lot of the Chinese players and had good time, but we weren't winning. So that's the brutal part of, of football in Asia. As soon as the team's not winning and, and the manager gets the sack, the manager that, that brought me in, the writing's on the wall that they want to change the foreign players. And I ended up coming back to Brisbane on a four year deal. One of the questions that we've had, Matt, is do you, when you went over to Scotland, uh, do you have regrets of going over? Well, yeah, well, I know I didn't play as much as I wanted to play, but I had to do it. If I didn't go, I'd have a bigger regret of not going. So, you know, I got to experience playing at Ibrox and, you know, alongside some great players that are still doing really well in leagues over there. So it was a good test for me. And it was by accident that I have a glowing Celtic scarf in the background there. I don't know how it turned up. I have been looking at it and noticing it. I like when it turns blue. Uh, yeah, well, that's uh, Scottish colours. I want to challenge you on something. You have a reputation of telling jokes, uh, dad jokes, and not only dad jokes, but they're bad dad jokes. And this doesn't come from me. This comes from some of your play- the players that you played with. So I wanted to have the Matt Mackay joke or choke challenge. And the way it works, so you will tell three jokes and after each joke, the academy players will get to vote on whether it's one, terrific, two, passable, three, poor, or four, terrible. Are you up for the challenge? I am. Matt, it's over to you. Make this count your first bad dad joke. I just want to make everyone know that my delivery has always been terrible. All these three jokes are along the same line. Okay, so pick which one's the best. What do you call two girls at the beach? I don't know. Shelly and Sandy. <laughs> oh, that's oh, okay. I'm not going to give it away, but guys, I'll launch the poll. You've got 10 seconds. The poll has ended. And I can tell you that was a joke. Okay. So it was funny. 15% said it was terrific. Youth 15 need to be medicated. 39% said it was passable. 27% of us said it was poor and 18 said it was terrible. So really, that joke is passable. Okay, next joke. What do you call a guy that gets caught behind in cricket? I don't know. Nick. Okay, oh, you but you're a middle-aged man like me, so come on, young boys. All right, let's go. It's, it's, it's happening now. Let's end the poll. And the results are, there you go, terrible. Terrible. Yeah, terrible. 34%. <laughs> that one, I'm afraid, is a choke. Okay. All right, let's 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 go to the next one. Lucky last, it's, it's another name one. I hope you young guys know what this one is. What do you call a girl that puts her all her bills in the fire? I don't know. What do you call a girl who puts all her bills in the fire? Bernadette. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait until people get that one and now I'll launch it. You have to think about it. You liked that one, didn't you? Yeah, because I, I got it. I, no, I hadn't heard any of those jokes. Now, I don't know what your teammates have said. Your teammates have no idea. You should, Jerry Seinfeld, you should be in, you should be in comedy. These young boys don't know what Jerry Seinfeld is. Oh. Sorry, let's, uh, who, who's, uh, 
who's a, who's a comedian, Dylan? Kevin Hart. He's not funny, though. He's funny. <laughs> Kevin Hart is very funny. All right, Empire. This one, it says. Thanks, Moondog. That was a joke. And let's have a look. 40, nearly half of the people said that that baby was funny. That yeah. was terrific. Passable. That so that was, that, was, that was pretty awesome. So I, I don't know, Matt, what do you think? Do you think, uh, do you, think you are certainly you, you won that joke challenge? Look, I'm not a funny guy, but I try hard. So I think that uh, goes a long way. I think I have more quantity over quality. Well, that, that counts because one of them is going to be funny. We're going to go on to some question and answers because we have a bit of time. Let's just check short. Yeah, we do. But I want to ask the first question, even though I've asked all of them. The jersey you've got on, it's a, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is actually, I think it's the game I got injured against Japan. It was in Brisbane, World Cup qualifier. I played, probably played left back. I marked, I marked Okazaki, the, the guy from, he was at Leicester. And this is Uchida's jersey who was there right back. Yeah, there right back. I might have played left mid, I don't know. But it was at Suncorp Stadium. We ended up winning the game. Now, from Flynn Proctor, how different was the quality in Scotland than Australia? Which was better? Totally different. The climate's make a massive difference. You can run all day in Scotland. And the temperature here is a bit different. I found there physically they were a lot better. They are bigger, stronger, faster. But, yeah, the, the, I think the quality in the top two teams is a lot higher than Australia. I think uh, Australian teams could do right against all uh, the other teams in the league. Liam Ponting says, how much training did you do when you were 12 or 13? A lot. You know, I had school training. I spoke about before the school, the, the balance between school, club, and then representative teams is, is challenging. And I tried to apply myself to each and every one of those. So if I had a school training session, I was on the top of the game. I wanted to impress. I wanted to stand out because... You know, I was a better part of that team. I wanted to set an example. And then obviously with club, it was building toward my representative team. So I can't put an actual figure on how many sessions I was doing every week, but it was a lot. And it was, you know, a big commitment for my family and for my parents to, to get me to all those sessions. So I was always very grateful for that. How many different positions have you played in your career? Yeah, I mean, all throughout the midfield and left and right as well. I spent... In Korea, they liked me playing on the right-hand side of midfield because I could cut back onto my left foot, you know, being left-footed and being able to cross that way. They really liked the, you know, playing on the opposite sides. And some players are really good at that. I really enjoyed that season there. But for the national team, I played left back and left mid and center mid. And obviously center mid is probably my most preferred position. And being left-footed, I, I like being on the left side of that diamond. A question from a mystery guest by the name of Warren Moon. He says, Matty is a funny guy and loves to be part of the banter, but who is the funniest teammate you've ever had in your team? Insert Warren's name here. Oh, no, he said don't say that out loud. He actually didn't say that. But who is the funniest person you've ever had in your team? He knows that. He, he knows it's not him. It's probably Giggles. So that's Scott Higgins. He's a, a seven-foot redhead reserve goalkeeper uh, that we had in the Roar in the first a couple of seasons and he's still a good friend. He's got so many great stories and would always lighten the room. So it's important to have those characters in a change room in your team and you've got to be able to, to handle banter. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. I found that out early in my career being a youngster. You've got to be able to, if you're making fun of someone, you've got to be able to take it as well. So that's really important. Always smile when you're at training and and in games, because of that, the happier you are, you are, normally the better you play. Just for the record, Warren Moon did not put insert Warren Moon's name here. <laughs> right, that, was, that was a joke. It just wasn't as funny as your jokes. So yeah. from Cardiff, how do you stay motivated in tough times? Yeah, it is, it is difficult. I had, I had tough times through my career, and um, Scotland was one where I wasn't playing regularly because I'd played regularly before that, every other place I'd been. But like I said, if you show up to training, I always show up to training with a smile and, and worked hard and, and generally an opportunity would come. Throughout periods, if you lose form, 
the only way to to get form back uh, or to get confidence is just to work harder. And you know, I found that if I did that bit extra, you know, that confidence would come and and being happy away from football is important as well. So try and get in that happy place wherever it is, being at uh, with your family away from football and doing the right things and generally your football will improve as well. From Maddox, who was the best player that you versed and who was the most competitive player you versed? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I played against some some pretty quality players. The Spain midfield um, when we played in the World Cup was awesome. You know, they'd already been knocked out as well. That was a, kind of like a dead rubber, but, you know, I got to play against Iniesta, Fabregas, David Silva. So that, that midfield was... Um, was pretty awesome. Toughest. I mean, there's, there's some real competitive guys out there, be that in the A League or in internationals. You know, I played against Honda, both for the national team. I marked him in a game in Sidema in front of 60,000 people. And he's an extremely competitive guy. And that showed also when he came back to the A League with Melbourne Victory. But yeah, there's a multitude of players that are, they're really competitive and that's why they get where they are because they, they do love the game. Hey, Matt, I heard you're hoping the GPS season is canned for football because you're scared to verse Churchy. I am very excited for the GPS season. Being a coach at Brisbane Grammar, I really enjoyed it and hopefully there's a couple of the boys on this chat here that are listening to things I've said that will be playing a part in my team. But also, um, you know, the GPS competition or whichever school competition these boys are in, it creates a great stage where they're under a bit more pressure as well. Okay, so throughout MPL games, you've got the pressure there. But with GPS games, you're playing for your school, you're playing for your peers um, and with your peers in, in, in big games. So hopefully I want to see bigger crowds at these games and these GPS games where they're under a bit of pressure and, and see how they cope with it because these guys, you know, the academy players, further you get along in your career, the more – the bigger the crowds you have, the more pressure. It's um, it's a good practice. So, no, I'm not scared of, not scared of Churchy at all. And I have a feeling I know who that is. But no, I'm not scared. I, I really enjoyed the coaching side of it and, and helping out at Grammar, and, and hopefully it's a good season. Just to be clear, what's the score when Churchy plays Brisbane Grammar this season? Can you predict the score? I think we'll win. We did get dusted. I think it was three 0 last year, but that was one. Absolute freak of nature player. But this year, I think, yeah, I think the tables could be turned. Were you successful at school? I got an OP5. That's pretty good. Yeah, I, I mean, I did, I did what was required with the, you know, the hand I was dealt. You know, I was at the Qu- uh, Queensland Academy of Sport at the time and I was working hard on my football, um, but I always did my work. So, you know, I'd, I probably could have done more study. Of course, you can always do more, but you know, I was pretty happy with how I finished my schooling. What is the most commonly asked question by your students and what's the best advice you can give players today? Yeah, I, I want them to ask more questions, to be honest, some of the, the guys at school. And I know that's kind of a thing these days. That some guys are fairly quiet, but I've got a lot of knowledge. But I think the overriding things for, for these kids is, is the balance of being able to, you know, to train at school to train with the academy at Brisbane Raw and then get your schoolwork done. It's about that balance. It's just not wasting any spare time you have. You know, back in the day when I was at school, you know, I finished in 2000, I didn't have a mobile phone. So, you know, my tip to some of these guys is maybe, and I'm similar now, right, when I've got my kids, maybe just throw that phone in, into a drawer and that would create a bit more time to do your work, um, your schoolwork to catch up and make sure you're on top of that because that's uh, the most important thing at this stage is to get that correct and then you can apply yourself in football, be it at training or in games. So then a question has just been asked now is I don't go to a school that has a soccer program or a football program. Should I? No, I mean, it depends. There's plenty of non-football schools out there that are, that are very good. Depends on your circumstances. You know, I'm very fortunate to be a part of a, you know, a very good school at Brisbane Grammar. But always concentrate on your education first. I know people say it and, and you think, yeah, okay, I get it. My parents tell me that all the time, but that's your foundation. It always will be your foundation with or without football. 
Uh, and then once that's sorted, then your football can do the talking. You can build your career if you want to in football from there. So and you've always got that backing, which is important. So even throughout my career, I, I went to uni when I was at the Raw for the first six or seven years I was at the Raw. So, you know, I was doing a teaching degree and never quite finished the actual teaching degree side of it, but I have got a degree from that, which is, which is awesome. It, it, it opens doors for me, you know, which I wouldn't have um, without that education. Who was the best player you played for? Uh, sorry, played alongside? I think at Brisbane, Thomas Broish, no doubt. I played with some other special players at Brisbane, but he be on our left-hand side, Shane Stefanudo, then me and, and Thomas Broish had a really good connection through our successful years. And then also in the national team, playing with Harry Kuehl was, yeah, he he's a special guy. A really talented footballer and you know i had a especially at that asian cup the, the first one in 2011 we had um before one of the games we had five sides a keeper we had swartz through that keeper and then on my team it was uh luke wilkshire tim cahill harry and myself and i'm pretty sure i didn't touch the ball much it was just harry and timmy and they were on fire and, and we won won that little um tournament easily so just to be able to to see how they operate and how they look after their bodies and and how they um, play the games uh, really cool. So, in your opinion, what was the difference between the NSL and the A League in terms of football? So, those who don't know the NSL finished in 04 or whatever. Yeah, it was a bit more old school. It was it was it was professional yet probably more semi professional. That's you know the A League's a bit more full time and a bit more you know full on, but really talented players. There was more teams, so more opportunity. And I'm sure that will come eventually to the A-League. Maybe uh, it will be delayed a bit now with the old COVID stuff. But I think the, the opportunities were greater back then. And and you had some real, for me being a young player, some really big personalities um, that I could learn off and play against as well. So that was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good period being the back end of a, the National League. How important was team bonding? Extremely important. You know, it makes training better, it makes games better and it makes uh, the work environment more enjoyable and team bonding is uh, a part of that. What's your biggest setback in your career? Not really. Uh, no big injuries, uh, fortunately. And, you know, I had a uh, couple of six weeks, couple month injuries. So no big injury setbacks at all. Matt, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey. Is there anything that you think we've missed or any final message that you want to leave the players? No, thank you for for um, inviting me on. You know, I wish the players all the best. I hope you've been working hard in this period that you've been given programs. I know you've been given programs to work on. And when you do get back, just enjoy your football. You're going to have a lot in a, a short period of time. So look after your bodies, do the right things and enjoy your football because you now know what it's like without football, you know, not being able to be part of a team and, and go to trains and play games. So that should make you even more hungry. I know that now that I'm retired. So enjoy your football. I wish you all the best for the rest of the season. And, and hopefully you guys have the opportunity to play professional football in the future and, and um, follow your dreams. The only way to get there is hard work. So I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for your time. And also thank you to Warren Moon for organising this webinar. It's been really fantastic and I've really appreciated the opportunity to interview somebody who I admire so greatly, your amazing career, your amazing human, and all the best in the GPS season coming up. I appreciate it. Yeah, good job. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm um, always a bit nervous with these things, but um, even with that Celtic sign in the back flashing at me, I won't hold that against you. So thanks very much for organising. Mamakai, good night. Cheers.